willingly agree to take a few questions. Questions that are questions uh, rather than comments. So excellent, excellent, excellent. It, it took me back to all the college time reading for economics for me. I went to higher Canada and studied under all those famous economists. Uh, but one question is uh, uh, is, is the decline, uh, what you call the decline of Indian economics or uh, belief in what old nationalist economists did, was it because of the general dissolution with, meant with the state intervening, um, the Keynesian school of thought, uh, which if you recall the swing towards, uh, you know, the extreme right version of market economics started after Margaret Thatcher abandoned it in England, and soon after that Ronald Reagan. Would you think that had a role to play? You see, I think that's a very interesting question. Uh, is the decline of Indian economics is uh, you see the decline of Indian economics, as you put it, is not because of a disillusionment with the interventionist state. All the nationalists, most of them, at least most of them, were not so much in favor of state intervention. You see, Ranade, Navroji, and so on, they did not, they did not favor complete laissez-faire, but at the same time they recognized, they were not Marxists, okay? They did not advocate a total, uh, total control of the state over the economic levers of the country. So that is certainly not, not, not that factor. As a matter of fact, people like Brahman and Vakil, whom I mentioned in this, see, we are essentially believers in free market. We're essentially believers in free market. So the decline of Indian economics and the disillusion with markets, uh, with the disillusion with the state, central state, are not synonymous. Are not synonymous. Okay? The decline of Indian economics has to be traced to other factors. Has to be traced to other factors and not simply to this illusion. Uh, you know, disillusionment with the centralist state. So I think uh, that is, uh, but that, that's, a, that's an interesting question. That's an interesting question. Okay. That's an interesting question. Yes. So, sir, thank you for an excellent lecture, uh, as always and as always expected. Uh, I have one, just one question, but before that, since you mentioned about uh, uh, mathematics and you quoted uh, Amartya Sen about uh, being approximately right and uh, precisely wrong. The uh, uh, remark of, I can't resist the temptation of mentioning a recent uh, remark by Danny Roderick in his book uh, Economics Rules, a recent book, where he says economists use mathematics not because they are smart, but because they are not smart enough. So that, that is his line of thinking on mathematics, the role of math. Anyway, the question I wanted to ask you is this, is that you said that after 1970s there has been decline in the Indian, uh, Indian economics consistently. You also said that uh, those uh, like uh, Professor Brahmanand and Vakil and others would not have endorsed this 91 post-91 brand of uh, liberalization. So, this is just of course a hypothetical question. So, what kind of liberal approach given those circumstances would have been uh, advocated by those liberal, those or uh, economists of having that trend of thought if uh, Manmohan Montek was not the right approach? And if they were certainly dire and adverse. <coughs> See, the main. Uh, you see, I, I said that and I have said that deliberately. 
See, the essential thesis of the early, you know, sort of liberalizers, I would call them, early liberalizers. Now, for example, the Brahmananda Vakil. There are many, yeah, I mean, there are, but I'm taking Brahmananda Vakil as a sort of representative group, a representative position. Was an emphasis on reduction of inequality, reduction of poverty, via concentration of production on wage goods. That is very important. The main, the main problem, the main problem according to them was that you were focusing on the consumption of the rich. Consumption of the rich. Okay? Das Gupta has, and I think Pulit Narek has written an article in the latest, not the latest, uh, in EPW, recent EPW, where he talks about Das Gupta's economics of austerity. See, it was not a consumptionist model, slightly, uh, I'll go into a bit of jargon, you see. It is not, not consumptionist, you see. It is a model which is based on, it is so, it, that way it is not, not Keynesian at all, see. It is a more classical model. It's a more classical model in which production is focused, in which investment is made not into heavy goods or not into the goods which favor the consumption of the rich, but into goods which favor or which produce goods meant for the ordinary man's consumption. So that, I think, is a very, very important distinction. And then they were very much concerned with issues of inequality, poverty reduction, and so on. Secondly, the industrial structure that they envisaged okay, was not one in which public sector monopolies would be replaced by private sector monopolies. Okay. They were more from a much more sort of decentralized structure of production okay, in which you would have a number of small and medium industries, a great deal of encouragement to medium and small scale industries, okay, which is surprisingly missing from the modern liberalization philosophy. There might be lip service. There might be lip service to the small and medium scale industries in our liberalization sort of philosophy. But the harsh reality is that the public sector monopolies are being replaced by private sector monopolies. Okay. And oligarchy, if you want to say. And the government, the third rule is the third rule of the government. <laughs> They wanted government to distance, uh, Paramahatma, etc. wanted government to distance themselves from the markets. That is true, not interfere. But today what is happening, the liberal philosophy is that the government is acting as an agent of the industrialists and interfering in the market in order to turn the markets in favor of the big industries. Okay? So that I think, okay, this essentially, this essentially enabling role, enabling role of the state was not envisaged by Brahman. And of course, the consequences are there for all of us to see. Okay? Even though Swami Nathan Ayer may say that PKD is wrong, okay? there is a difference between PKD scholarship and Swami Nathan Ayer scholarship. Okay? So I think, even without going into details, you see, I would say that I would take PKD much more seriously than I would take Swami Nathan Ayer. But that said, sir, sorry, that reduction in poverty in India is uh, only after liberalization. Yeah, inequality remains an issue. But faster reduction in poverty between, say, 51 to 91 and 91 to even less than half that period, faster reduction in poverty, howsoever measured, has taken. No, no, you take uh, poverty. Uh, I mean, it's a deep issue, of course. See, the issue is Okay. Nobody disputes that. Okay. It would have been reduced by other categories also. Okay. And they were all tried. It's quite likely. They were all tried till 91. What is that? Between 51 and 91, where and there are the teams. No, no, that is true. That is true. Say that. But, you see, this is up to the point of view. What would have happened? This is all contrafactual. This is all contrafactual. My own assessment is that there were, as a matter of fact, in the early days I was 
I was a supporter of yeah, yeah. liberalization policy. We recall you were very much. I had written articles in support of liberalization. Yeah. I written articles in support of liberalization. Because the older system, the older system had developed certain strains which need to be corrected. Yeah. You see? It be, but as Swaminathan Ayer, uh, not Swaminathan Ayer, sorry, M.S. Swaminathan once said, okay, we wanted to open the door a little bit. We did not want to break down the door. Okay? You see? We wanted to open the door a little bit to foreign capital and to private initiative. Let them come in. But you see, we did not want But now the door has been broken. Okay? So that is essentially the difference. <coughs> so I, I, I wanted to ask two questions. You talked about the demise of Indian economies, economics. But Indian economists seem to be flourishing. <laughs> <laughs> Secondly, you said that for uh, there has to be some kind of homogeneity of circumstances before you talk about that Indian economics, European economics. But uh, Sharad Doshi always said that there is India, there is Bharat. So does the Indian economics really apply to situation in Bharat? That, that's the question which I expected. I certainly expected that question. See, the moment you admit that economics becomes a relative science rather than an absolute science, you have to allow for the fact that people will argue for Hindu economics, for Islamic economics, you see, for Maharashtrian economics, for Gujarati economics, for Kerala economics and so on. One has to draw the line somewhere. One has to draw the line somewhere. Okay. A good idea is destroyed by carrying it to its logical extreme. Okay. I'll once again give you an example from the Soviet planning. When the Russian Revolution occurred, there were the logical Marxists, led by Trotsky and several others, who said that we should try for world socialism. Every country should become Marxist. You see? So our effort should be directed towards world socialism. Stalin, whatever his flaws, whatever his flaws, he realized that that is carrying the socialism to its logical extreme and that is wrong and therefore he developed the slogan socialism in one country okay socialism in one country we will consolidate socialism in the soviet union and that is good to be objective so and socialism flourished for 70 years or whatever it is largely because stalin took this pragmatic position if we want to save indian economics serious and means by that we want to save India. If you want to have an economy, then we'll have to draw the line somewhere. We could draw the line somewhere. Okay? You say, okay, we admit Indian economics because there is a national jurisdiction to go along with it. Okay? Right? If we have Hindu economics or Islamic economics, you see there is no national jurisdiction to go with it. Okay? So let us adopt the criterion of a national jurisdiction okay, to limit Indian economics and the economics of Bharat okay, is essentially a manifestation of the fact that we have applied the liberalization model in a totally wrong way. Okay? You see? If you had applied the liberalization mo model with more sensitivity, okay, then this India Bharat divide would not have arisen. It has arisen in the first place. Okay? Because this model was applied, it basically is not flawed. Okay. Right. Well, I am not okay. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Vasudev is flourishing. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Yeah. Really, his speeches were excellent. In fact, he did mention about G.V. Joshi in some of his speeches. Some of them were excellent. Number one. Number two is the Soviet industrialization debate. 
you completely avoided mentioning about one, two economists who actually were the predecessors of the wage goods hypothesis, Shannon and Shakalnikov. If you go to the Ecosis article, or Ecosis book rather, that would be an excellent way of handling it. Because to me, there's an important, important event that was completely overlooked by a number of economists in India. In fact, uh, I am grateful to Professor Brahman for having really asked me to do that. The third point which I have got it is that actually speaking, the whole state of economics is in decay all over. It is not only in India. After all, it's not because of, not because of Mathinus, not because of neoclassical economics alone, but basically they are not able to see the hard realities on the ground and try to apply what may be regarded as a logical way of handling things. I think it is so, it is in doldrums, there is no doubt about it. In the United States, you will find hundreds of varied varieties of explanations given on various phenomena, but nobody is certain about its outcome, their own outcomes. That is a problem, actually. I don't know whether you would agree with me, but actually, your the entire panoramic Indian economic thought lecture is fascinating, but of course, it's, you can't cover it in one lecture or two lectures. You may have to write, write a book, in fact, if you want to write a book, in fact. But definitely one point which perhaps you may have to think a little bit more closely is on Gandhian economics. Uh, I think Gandhiji was not really an economist, no doubt, but then he was actually a person who came up from the sociological aspect of Indian uh, life at that point of time. And to some extent, probably, he was also influenced by the political ideologies at that time. But definitely the sociological aspect of India, of economic realities may need to be considered, may need to be considered. And I think there is not a single good book on the social, uh, sociological aspects of Indian economic development. I have not come across any such book. The only book perhaps which is really good on that is uh, Irma Edelman and Cynthia Morris. That was in 1966. Beyond that, you don't have it. Thank you. See, I think uh, I agree with, uh, with the bulk, uh, with the most of your comments, I agree. Okay, first of all, of course, in this kind of a review, it's very difficult to take into account everyone, okay? So I just touched upon a few highlights. So Kofar Krishna Gokhari, yes, and later on, people like Green Nara and Jan Chan, and several others, you see, were there. Difficult to, you know, mention everyone. So that point is well taken. Also, there are predecessors of wage goods models that, but, uh, there are predecessors of wage goods models that all, that point is also well taken. See, what is currently happening to the third sort of series of comments that you made, okay, I'd like to say that currently in leading universities in the US, there are two kinds of moments. One, is the movement for a dominant paradigm. Okay, in some universities, okay, there is a movement to consolidate neoclassical economics, the orthodoxy. Okay, right? And so that these departments are absolutely intolerant of anything which goes against this. Okay, right? So even if you come up with all the empirical evidence to show that the demand curve slopes upwards, Okay, you see, or that the indifference curves, <laughs> you see, intersect. Okay, <laughs> they will just say that you revise your data, something is wrong, something is wrong, something is wrong. Okay, they will not accept the result unless it supports the hypothesis. Now, this is a totally unscientific principle. Okay, totally unscientific principle. If I, if I am a doctor and I keep on administering a certain drug to a patient, to patients, and they keep on dying, you see, I cannot say. I cannot persist with that drug. I will lose my license. Okay. Right. You have to respect empirical evidence. You have to respect empirical evidence. Okay. And therefore, in one of the books on econometrics, in my book on econometrics, I have mentioned up, you see, every regression counts. Every regression counts. Every mathematical result counts. 
because even the guy who gives you some misleading result or some anti intuitive result has got a contribution to make okay you have to consider why is this anti intuitive result coming up that is one thing so in a sense you see this kind of an approach is kind of, which is is and is only true in economics i can't think of any other discipline where if if a physicist you see keeps on saying you know that uh, uh, things are floating upwards in my lab okay <laughs> you see that will be a challenge to the gravitation principle and i think the standard result there of course is einstein's you see famous precession of the perihelion of mercury okay that mercury's you see orbit was showing a distortion okay he came up with that observation and that became a challenge to newton's theory and the profession accepted it they did not accept it for a long time einstein became famous not in 1916 when he published the general theory of relativity he became famous in 1921 when astronomers observed that mercury was really moving according to einstein's theory of relativity so that shows the healthy respect that astronomers and physicists have for empirical evidence okay and economists treat empirical evidence with the utmost contempt okay you see the lowest the lowest person in the academic hierarchy of a typical american university is the econometrician okay the highest person on the ladder of the academic hierarchy is the theorist okay so that is one thing but now fortunately there is also a movement especially in european universities okay which i would call as broadly pluralistic they would like different kinds of views different kinds of model different kinds of views to exist let the student choose let the student choose see and fortunately there are different alternatives we don't examine them we don't learn them our students don't know them you see in my forthcoming book on macroeconomic crisis i've seen yes the neoclassical standard explanation is there it's also the post keynesian explanation see there is also the neo keynesian explanation there is also the austrian explanation there is a structural explanation there is a marxist explanation all of them have given explanations of the global financial crisis we only stick to the new classical you know explanation so you see pluralism helps pluralism helps okay let let our you see my point is limited my point is limited. i am not saying that kick out new classical economics and have something else it is very difficult it is very difficult okay to replace a paradigm completely but what you can certainly do is you can admit other modes of thinking you can admit other modes of thinking you see economics is not a science in which knowledge progresses linearly that happens in physics okay kuhn's paradigm kuhn's paradigm is a very good model kuhn's paradigm shift is a very good model for the natural sciences okay where one theory is replaced by another einstein replaced newton newton replaced the ptolemaic theory of the universe and so on okay in economics that does not happen nothing replaces anything else see everything is there everything is there everything. at some point of time something becomes more relevant some theory becomes more relevant than another theory in some context some theory becomes more relevant than another so you should be see the uh, fiscal stimulus the fiscal stimulus is a keynesian this thing okay all the new classical economists strongly criticized the us government on the fiscal stimulus people like james cochran and several others they said what is this you see fiscal stimulus but fortunately policy makers have a much more pluralistic attitude because they have to live they have to survive you see they have to survive the next election therefore their attitude is much more pragmatic much more. and therefore they adopted keynesian policies when it suited them okay i think that Sorry to keep you. Yeah. 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 Gives the final comment on today this evening's um, lecture. Um, you took me back many many years when, as a young student, we were always given this: you know, is economics a science or an art? We all had to tackle that question. Dr. Nachnik.
um, thank you so much for walking us through this um, historical survey of economics and of course for pointing out so many things that uh, uh, none of us probably, and I speak on behalf of the audience, uh, could have thought about. Um, obviously, in uh, just about an hour, you cannot cover everything. Uh, I must thank uh, those who raised questions um, uh, that gave us an opportunity to hear further. Uh, and um, we, I'm sure we will all look forward to the book that you are now uh, working on. Um, for me, um, um, I appreciate Aristotle's attitude to poetry since <laughs> my subject is not economics. But um, I, did, I did learn a lot today from you. Thank you so much. Um, there were some terms that impressed me. Uh, you talked about conflict of interest and cognitive capture and fascinating terms. All I have to say is there was no conflict of interest here today. Everyone appreciated all that you had to say and you certainly captured our attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Nanchne, for having agreed to come to speak to us. We were all looking forward to this. We have to, of course, thank Dr. Vatsala Naren for being here today for having always taken the interest you have in all our annual lectures and uh, the concern you show for the choice of speaker. Uh, you certainly were able to get us Dr. Najni. Perhaps we might not have succeeded on our own. And um, uh, it's always been, of course, in consultation with our chairperson of the endowment lectures, Dr. Meena Vaishampayan. Um, I know she's around, but uh, we always do remember to thank her for, for locating, for identifying appropriate speakers for our evening. Um, thank you, Mr. Kali, for having agreed to preside and also raise some important issues on economics. Finally, thank you, every one of you, for having come this evening. I'm sure you have all benefited. Good night.